It's one o'clock. We're going to get started. Thank you for attending. Um, this is the Rhode Island Tobacco Cessation. This is a part of a three series. This is the last part. Um, and we are bringing in your community pharmacists, Bethany Ramos and Dr. Anita Jacobson, to give us a little bit of information on how you can utilize your local community pharmacist in tobacco cessation. Um, as a quick reminder to folks, here at Health Centric Advisors, we are part of the IPRO Quinn QIO. The Quinn QIO is a federally funded Medicare quality innovation network. Um, we represent the states of Rhode Island, Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Um, but we cover the territory that you see on the map. Today, um, we have some alarm, learning objections objectives, some pharmacy resources, and we hope to have an open discussion. Go ahead and chat in your name, your organization, and your role. Um, tell us what brings you here today. Um, are you having trouble talking to patients, etc.? After the session today, um, you're going to know how a pharmacist can help you and your patient with their tobacco journey and learn what can be prescribed to help you quit smoking. I'm going to introduce our two speakers today, Dr. Anita Jacobson and Bethany Ramos. Dr. Anita Jacobson is a clinical professor at the University of Rhode Island of Pharmacy and has worked as a pharmacist in a variety of patient care settings for 25 years. She is the director of the Community First Responder Program, which focuses on harm reduction, overdose education, and a lock zone outreach, and serves as the hub of the Northeast Rural Opiate Technical Assistance Regional Center. Bethany Ramos is a P4 student finishing APPE rotations and graduating from the University of Rhode Island in May. Post-graduation, she will be completing a res residency at Kent Hospital in Warwick, Rhode Island. Her interests, interests include psychiatry and oncology and she hopes to pursue them as part of her career as a pharmacist. And now we're gonna hand it over to these presenters. Okay, I'm just gonna share my slides really quickly. So today, um, Dr. Jacobson and I are here to talk to you about the impact of a pharmacist and pharmacy's impact overall on smoking cessation. So to set the scene, um, I'm going to start with a few statistics. Um, so in 2020, um, a study found that 47.1 million adults in the United States have used some type of tobacco products, and two-thirds of all of those people express the desire to quit, but unfortunately, only a small percentage of the people who express the desire to quit actually received any type of help from a, uh, a healthcare professional. And switching gears and somewhat backtracking to start talking about pharmacy's role in um, tobacco cessation therapy, in 2004, New Mexico became the first state to allow pharmacists to prescribe in some capacity for smoking cessation products. And since then, now we're in 2023, and the studies I've been looking at were all in 2022, um, 22 states have some sort of agreement to allow pharmacists to either autonomously prescribe or prescribe tobacco cessation products under a collaborative practice agreement. So why would we want a pharmacist to prescribe tobacco cessation therapies? And my answer to that would be accessibility. So the National Association of Chain Drug Stores um, in 2015, this is a survey that went out, found that nine out of 10 people live within five miles of a community pharmacy and people who live in metropolitan areas live even closer than five miles. And then when we think about a community pharmacy versus patients going to their provider's office, they're open much more frequently than a provider's office. Typically seven days a week, we have our 24 hour pharmacies and appointments generally at this point typically have no cost associated with them other than if there's a copay for their medications or appointments are able to be scheduled not as far out as if you were to see a primary care physician. This study also looked at pharmacists in regards to patient trust or how patients rate pharmacists and found that they were ranked within the top three most trusted healthcare professionals 
nurses being number one and pharmacists and doctors tied for two and three. And just a note, um, pharmacy, you, you know, colleges of pharmacy and their curriculum embed counseling and medication education about tobacco cessation products and therapies specifically. So we're all very highly trained to help patients with their um, tobacco cessation therapy. So what is prescribed for tobacco cessation? Starting with over-the-counter, we can utilize nicotine replacement therapies being the gum, the lozenge, or the patches. Switching over to the more behind-the-counter or pharmaceutical category, the prescription category, I should say, we also have NRTs, the inhalers or nasal sprays, and we also have Chantex and Bupropion that can be utilized for these patients. And so just to give an overall synopsis of the states that do authorize some sort of prescribing, as you can see, it's different from state to state and they have different regulations or what they're allowed to prescribe. Um, so there's 22 states total. And for more of a visual, I also created um, like a color coded map and you can see that some states are allowed to prescribe all FDA approved products, whereas other states are more um, just limited to nicotine replacement therapy or even just over the counter regimens. So as I've been talking about, um, there's a lot of variability between states, unfortunately, in regards to what they can prescribe and how pharmacists can prescribe these therapies. Um, specifically under a collaborative practice agreement, <laughs> There's two forms of collaborative practice agreements that are utilized, a patient specific one where the patient would have to see their provider and then be referred to a pharmacist, which is somewhat restrictive because we're not really getting over that hurdle of going in and seeing a doctor before they're prescribed. And then there's also a population specific collaborative practice agreement that some states utilize where any patient that meets the inclusion criteria specified in their CPA is allowed to be seen by a pharmacist and be treated by a pharmacist without seeing any other healthcare professional. Unfortunately, like I've been talking about, states um, have different restrictions on what pharmacists can prescribe and boards of pharmacies have different training procedures and different credentialing procedures, which limits in some cases to what states can prescribe if they can prescribe anything. So hopefully in the future, we see that it switches to a more federal kind of say to cover all 50 states. So at least there's a baseline so we can reach more patients and make more outcomes and positive outcomes for our patients. Leading more towards studies that I've looked into, this first one um, looked at pharmacists versus primary care provider led tobacco cessation services. It ranged for about a year. So from March of 2020 to February of 2021 at a health center in Ohio. And the main point of what they wanted to look at was the percentage of patients who achieved abstinence after 30 days when in the pharmacist treated group in the PCP treated group. So what we found um, for this primary objective was that 22.2% of patients in the pharmacist group reported a 30 day abstinence, whereas 9.4 patients perceived or had a 30 day abstinence. Um, Unfortunately, just because the study was so small, we didn't really achieve a power to have a statistically significant result, but obviously with such a big difference, it's a, it's a clinically significant result for our patients. And moving into the patient satisfaction side of the services, um, patients found that pharmacists were able to help them how to understand their medications and how to properly use their medications to help them with quitting, while also identifying changes for their behaviors to help them quit and following up with them. I think these are all very important because knowing why they're taking their medication and how to properly use their medication is going to help them with their quit attempt. Because if you're using the nicotine gun, but you're not using it correctly, it won't work. Or if you're not taking the nicotine patches off and you're up all night because you have nicotine going through your body, you won't be happy and you'll stop using it. And um, another thing that this study looked at was a comparison of what was prescribed and how these providers were spending their time with the patient. So what we saw is that there wasn't much difference, but pharmacists were more likely to prescribe pharmacotherapy, so be appropriate on or Chantix to their patients. 
the more important in my eyes side of things for that pharmacists spent more time following up with their patients and providing that really important counseling to their patients, making sure they understood how to take the medication and what to expect from their medication, make sure they had a successful quit attempt. And another study that I looked at focused specifically on Chantix, um, again, uh, with a pharmacist group and a provider group. So what we found is there were similar rates of discontinuation between growth groups, but statistically significant differences between patient adherence and um, an earlier time to follow up in the pharmacist group. So from the greater adherence and the greater follow-up, this study really looked at pharmacists being equal and effective providers for tobacco cessation. And it proved that we can take some of the workload off of other clinicians and really be part of a healthcare team to overall improve outcomes for our patients, which I think is everybody's overarching goal for patient care. So um, with that said, I just have a reference slide at the end, but if anyone has any questions or anything they would like to add, I'd like to open up the floor. I do have a couple of questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, the states that do have full like FDA prescribing capabilities, are there smoking numbers? better than the states that don't? So I didn't see anything, probably because there's quite a few at this point. There's 14 of the 22 that allow it um, about overall every state, but I did see that New Mexico has much higher rates of quit and smoking cessation in general, which was that first state to allow pharmacists prescribing. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So I have a question. So yeah. in those states that have full prescribing, then you can bill. Is that correctly? Am I saying that correct? I would assume, yeah. So okay. it would be there'd be some type of payment process as a prescriber would do for like their okay. own visit. And then we'd also bill like the medication through their drug coverage is what I would assume would happen. For the pharmacist end, that's what I'm talking about. I know the PCP can bill. Right. But okay. It's it. not the same codes, though. Oh, it's um, not. Oh, and the okay. reimbursement rates are variable, um, and it varies by plan. Okay. So, you know, it, it can be almost like a dispensing fee, um, okay. or it can, you know, depending on the setting, sometimes it's what we call an incident to billing, uh, if the pharmacist has a relationship with a provider. So it's, it really depends on the model and the insurance okay. company and the contracts that they have. Okay, so it's different even even though it's in the state, it depends on if the insurance in that state is right. Because some states okay. don't recognize pharmacists as providers. Right. right. So. Okay. Got it. Still a good thing because you do probably have um if a patient has um a question and they're in the pharmacy anyway, they can just walk up to the counter and ask that pharmacist which they can do anyway, anywhere, but can they call? Do you know if that's how it works? Are they able to just put a phone call in to the pharmacist at the dispensing pharmacy to ask a specific question or? So certainly um, patients are always welcome to call the pharmacy to ask mm -hmm. questions, but um, if it was going to be where they were prescribing via, you know, that falls into telehealth, right? So then that would oh, fall okay. under telehealth regulations. But you know, I worked in community pharmacy as a pharmacist for, you know, over 10 years. And what we would see is often people want to quit smoking around holidays. Um, so that especially New Year's is a big one, but others as well. Uh, so they would come in and they're all geared up. I'm ready to quit. And it's Friday night. And I'm like, I'm happy to sell you the patch, but it is whatever cost it is. And they're like, well, I, I want it covered under my insurance. So then that's the barrier because in a state like Rhode Island, where pharmacists can't prescribe even an over-the-counter medication, which, I mean, you know, in my opinion, is really very silly uh, that we can't prescribe something that somebody can buy. Right. Um, and clearly their insurance wants them to have because their insurance, you know, the cost of the burden of disease from smoking is so much higher than the cost of the product. So 
you know, it's very frustrating. It feels like practicing with one arm tied behind your back because, exactly. you know, oftentimes people are ready, willing, they want to pull the trigger and they'll walk away from the pharmacy because of the price tag yeah. on the gum patch or lozenge. And if we could just RX it for them, give them information and counseling, even if we weren't billing for that visit, it's a service, it's a connection. Um, it improves patient care. You know, we've been advocating for it in Rhode Island for 10 years, uh, and it has not gone through legislatively to date. This could be the yeah, year. It could be. Let's hope. So, you know, all those programs out there like Good RI and all of that, the script can't go through that because it's not really a script. Is that correct? So yeah, in order for it to be covered by insurance, commercial insurance, there needs to be a prescription. Now, there are some programs like the quit line where they may have the ability to, um, to give nicotine replacement therapy, and certainly some provider offices may have it there to give out. So there, there are different sort of like public service models for accessing it. Uh, kind of like we have with naloxone, right? Naloxone is a prescription product, mm -hmm. but it can be given out in other mechanisms. So that does exist. But the the sort of classic pharmacy model uh, to date in Rhode Island, you know, we are not able to do anything other than sell it over the counter okay. or fill a prescription from a provider. Okay. Good to know. So I have a question. So what it, in order to get the, um, you know, to help Rhode Island get to the point where pharmacists can prescribe that? What is the advocacy that needs to happen with that? Yeah, so we have had a bill up there since 2014 when I was the president of the Rhode Island Pharmacists Association. We drafted and, you know, have support. Um, Representative Teresa Tanzi has been very involved with it on the Senate side. It's been Senator Bridget Valverde. Um, it basically has moved through um, committee and passed on the House side a few times and then sort of just gotten held for further study on the Senate side. So it's just, you know, getting this to be a legislative priority. I think having people write their senators and representatives saying this is important, um, you know, because people, if they're not hearing from their constituents that this is something that they care about, then, you know, that doesn't become a priority. Exactly. Good. And when patients come in and they don't have um, a script, are you just are you in advising them to get a script from their provider? Certainly. And sometimes we can do a warm handoff where we're calling right in front of them and we say, hey, we have, you know, Mr. or Mrs. whoever in front of us and they would like a prescription and the provider is like, absolutely. And it can just happen, but not on a Saturday of New Year's Eve. Right. So right. It, uh, and, and honestly, that is often when these things happen. They're they're really very holiday focused is my experience. And, you know, um, again, it's you know, you want to strike while the iron is hot because people, you know, sort of get this momentum. And then if that momentum is lost, it's a missed quit attempt. Yeah. Great. Great questions. We have any other questions? Okay. Okay. Just gonna... Oh, God, rookies over here, me. Um, we do have uh, some resources available. Um, these include the top five evidence-informed strategies to improve smoking, um, cessation effort, as well as some tips and tricks for billing and coding. Um, when you're spending that time talking to the patients that can be billed for, for more on the provider side. We do have an upcoming event, um, Universal Precautions and Pain Management. It's a person-centered approach to preventing opiate misuse. This is also part of a six-part series. Um, so don't miss that. And we thank you all for joining and have a good day.